are uh, placed on silent mode and uh, flash photography is strictly prohibited. Uh, for the Jaipur uh, bookmark speakers, there are uh, ferries at 4 p.m. You can contact the travel desk. We're delighted to introduce Vanishing Voices, the great Andamanese languages. Please welcome Avnita Abhi with, in conversation with Arsha Satar, endangered languages. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us <clears throat> in a session entitled Endangered Languages. Um, it's one of the sub-themes of the festival, along with crime and punishment. And I think it's interesting to think of endangered languages and crime and punishment together, because it is a crime that we do have languages um, <coughs> within the borders of, of our nation state that are endangered that are disappearing, that are dying. And we have a very, um, if I can say, very, very expert person with us, Professor Anvita Abbi, who is a professor of linguistics at JNU in New Delhi. She's an author of 16 books, and her work on tribal and other minority languages of South Asia has been exemplary and has bagged several national and international awards. Most recently, her most recent award has been the Padma Shri in uh, 2013, um, which recognizes her pioneering work on the highly endangered languages of the Andaman Islands. Um, <clears throat> Professor Abi has worked for 30 years with minority languages and for nearly a decade in the Andamans. Um, so we're gonna have a relatively freewheeling conversation. Um, and I know that for most of us, certainly for me, um, we think of the Andamans as a holiday destination. Yeah? <laughs> um, one of the most beautiful parts of what we call India. Um, we also think of Kalapani. We think of the jail uh, <clears throat> where many luminaries, louder, okay, sorry. Um, luminaries of uh, our historical past were incarcerated, including the Savarkars. Um, perhaps more recently, we were um, alerted to the extreme fragility of the Andamans as, as a habitat uh, when the tsunami hit. Um, and now we're going to consider another um, fragile aspect of the, of the Andamans, which is their languages. So, how did you get into studying minority languages? As a linguist, there were so many choices, but you chose minority languages. Thank you, Arsha, for asking me. Uh, uh, Can't hear. Can you hear me? Come forward. No, no. Let's Let increase please. the volume. Can you hear me now? OK, is this better? OK, thanks for coming to this session for endangered languages, because not, this is not a very hot area and not very popular uh, in the literature so far. Uh, well, she is asking me, how did I get into this uh, business of working on uh, minority and uh, endangered languages? Well, um, I am a linguist by profession, and I chose to work on tribal languages to begin with as my career. And I started working on tribal languages in 1976. And then one after another, when I scaled through states after states, I realized some of the languages structures are very less known or least known. So I got them, got interested into them. 
And then it came, it dawned upon me that the languages of the Andaman Islands are totally untouched and are dying fast because the number, the, the demographic figure was very dismal. So this is how I got interested into the languages of the Andaman. So I shifted my focus from mainland India to the Andaman Islands. Okay, now when we were talking <coughs> briefly yesterday, you mentioned that within the Andamanese languages, there are several language families, more than we had initially um, expected. And also, uh, which I was quite stunned by, that your research indicates that this was probably the first language ever spoken, or among the first languages that humans ever spoke. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, uh, you asked two questions. One is, uh, uh, I'll first answer your first question yes. first. Yes, before I started working, linguists believed that there were only one language family called Andamanese, and this had three branches, Jarawa, Onge, and Great Andamanese. After my research, I realized that there were two distinct language families. One was Great Andamanese, and other I called Angan, because both Onge and Jarwas called themselves, themselves Ang. So the Angan language families, and there's a great Andamanese family. And later on, my research was corroborated by geneticists by uh, uh, analyzing the empty DNA, mitochondrial DNA samples. As far as your second question is concerned, yes, great Andamanese is a family of language. And it had 10 language, languages in its rubric. But most of the languages died in mid-30s. So when I reached the island, the Andamanese were placed in a small island called Strait Island, which is about 56 nautical miles away from Port Blair City. And Andamanese live in this, they, they, this is a small island, Strait Island, mainly jungle. And they, they were drawn from the north of Andaman. So some spoke Skora, some spoke Sare, some spoke Jero, and some spoke uh, other languages. And the conglomeration of these four languages actually gave rise to this present great Andamanese, and that's why I call it PGA, a present great Andamanese. I didn't want to mention any particular name, because had I done so, I would have empowered one language over the other when it is a mixture, you see. So that's why I, I call it present great Andamanese. Okay, another set of two questions. Yeah. You mentioned that, um, there was a greater linguistic diversity or more languages existed until the mid-1930s. So what is it that happened in the 30s that changed this? Well, there are several documents available, but I'm not sure how far they are authentic, but one of the greatest cause for the death of these languages was the contact with the outsiders. Ah. And uh, since the Andamanese have known to, lived in known to be living in isolation, for thousands and thousands of years, uh, and this is also true of Jarwa today, that they don't have immunity to be in touch and contact with us. So when they come into contact with the outsiders, they, they're susceptible to diseases and common problems and ailments, and they die. There has also been documented by Portman that hundreds of Jarwa, hundreds of Andamanis were captured in a something called home, tribal Andamani home, and all the children died before they reached one year of age. So this is how you know, the, the population get a, started getting depleted because of uh, lack of sensitivity towards the tribals. Much like in other countries, uh, well, in, in North America, for example, the vulnerability of native um, Americans to outsiders in South America as well. And then, of course, the, the terrible um, genocide of the native peoples of Australia, yes. where also they were put in camps and their, mm -hmm. children, their children were taken away from them, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of rupture. Loss also, generation, yeah, as exactly. they said, yeah. So it leads, uh, leads to um, loss of language and what we'll talk about in the second half of the session, um, a loss of memory. Um, so that we can all participate more fully in this conversation, I'm going to ask Professor Abi uh, to run a little audio visual so it'll get, give you a better sense of what her work does, uh, what her work is, and what her work does in the sense of um, uh, mm, preserving, nurturing, protecting an extremely fragile linguistic system. So is it okay to run Yeah, this? sure. Yeah? Karthik.
can't see that screen. I can now see. Okay, next. This is the map of the Andaman Islands, as you can see. Uh, the actually it's 1,200 kilometers away from Chennai or Kolkata, and these set of islands, which are closer to Myanmar than to India, are s approximately 250 islands stretching from north to south. And I worked on the languages which are in the Great Andaman, the, ma the, the bigger body of uh, islands is known as Great Andaman, and the small little in the south is known as Little Andaman. I worked on both in the north as well in the south of these, language, these, un these Andaman islands. Now this, is, this slide gives a good uh, answer to what Arshi asked me in the beginning, that why I was so concerned about working on the languages of the Andaman. On, uh, in one map, as you can see, uh, there is a, you, you can see the entire area is painted green. This was the situation 100 years ago when Great Andamanese populated the entire set of islands. And then there were Jarwas, which are yellowish, I can see, can't see from here properly. And then there were Jangil, uh, which is in red color. And blue is Little Andaman, which was habited by Onges. But in, within 100 years, the situation becomes, became so uh, dismal and uh, devastating that now this is the current situation. The Great Andamanese have been pushed to a little island, as I just said, in Strait Island. So the entire area from north to south of the Great Andaman is devoid of any Great Andamanese. Jarvas are pushed up, so they have now, they are living on the western coast of the Great Andaman. But the ATR, the Andaman Trunk Road, which cuts through and through their forest, has totally not only dislocated them, but this, it has also dislocated them and deprived them of their uh, daily means of subsistence because they live on jungles. The Onges have also been reduced to 106 uh, members or such uh, the, because there are not very many people left in that uh, tribe either. So you can see all the three tribes, though they are surviving, but they are very few in number. And others, as you can see, uh, Jangil is lost to us. Yes, Sentinelese is there, and thanks, thanks to Sentinelese, they don't allow any kind of an intervention from outside, and hence they have survived so far. Next. Uh, can you press key one by one? Yeah. This is the figure of the languages, uh, the number of speakers that now are surviving. And I worked on all three, the top three, but I certainly could not work on Sentinelese for the obvious reasons. And uh, I did this uh, research in two phases. And the first phase was in the form of a pilot survey of all these languages. And I wrote a grammatical sketches of all the three languages, which proved that there are two separate language families. And this is all in captured in this book called Endangered Languages. No, this is Endangered Languages of the Andaman Islands. This was published from Germany. And uh, this actually encapsulates the three linguistic systems. Uh, and there is co it's accompanied by a CD-ROM, which has folk songs and uh, some sound audio files from all the three tribes, some pictures. I'll show you some pictures just to familiarize you with the communities. Next, please. This is the island where I stayed, and it's my Karam Bhumi, as I tell my friends because that's where I stayed most of my time. Uh, I spent there, and there, is, there are no worldly goods or facilities available. The electricity used to come just for a couple of hours uh, in the night. And, uh, but it was, I enjoyed every moment uh, that I spent with the tribes. Next. <coughs> this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, I mean, I cannot read from this side, but, uh, this seems like a, one of the oldest languages which, uh, uh, which really was spoken on this part of India because Andamanese are considered to be the remnants of the first migration that took place out of, Andam uh, out of Africa 70,000 years ago. And geneticists have proved that most of the time they lived in isolation without coming into contact with any outside world. So perhaps, uh, my grammar book, my, which was launched just a few months ago, uh, 
exposes for the first time a possible human language because this language has structures which are very unique. Okay, this is a Jarwa girl. She's singing, so you can hear her sing. <laughs> So the Jarawa boat song, as you can see that they sing in syllables, ta, 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 and this is also the, most of the time, the songs of Onges are like that too. This is one of the pictures that when I was interviewing the Jarawa boy. Next. This is the map of the little Andaman, and I spent some time in the north of Andaman. It's not easy to reach there because there are creeks and creeks full of huge crocodiles and one has to cross through that, you cannot escape. This is some of the pictures with the Jarawa boys. Uh, this is a song from, uh, sorry, Onge, I'm sorry, I'm saying yeah, Onge's. Next. Now this is the community I worked with at depth and as extensively as possible because the, uh, this also shows one of two last speakers who are no more with us. One is in the pink uh, blouse, the last speaker of Bo language, Boa Senior. And uh, then uh, another woman in black blouse, uh, gray hair, she's Khora speaker, the last speaker of Khora language. So now only two languages are remaining. They are Sare and Jero. These are the two languages which have some speakers, but others are left in this world. This is a picture I just brought to show you that how the modernization is catching up. Hinduization is also uh, becoming popular. This uh, a great Andamanese girl is wearing a vermilion sindoor in her, in her party because she's married a Bengali. And the girls are marrying outside the community, they are wearing clothes that we wear. So next, next. These are the 10 uh, great Andamanese communities and their languages. Uh, I've just put the map instead of in the vertical uh, uh, position, I put in horizontal that you can see. And the only, the last, the, uh, the Akabo, Aka, Khare, Khora, and these are the four languages which constitute the present great Andamanese. These speakers were spread out in the north. Government of India picked them up from, the, from their respective islands and put them in an island called Strait Island because they thought otherwise they'll get lost into the humanity. So to, I mean, this was they thought that so to preserve their community, their culture, their language, they put them in the, but tribals don't like it and they miss their, obviously, the islands. Because you must remember, if you dis dislocate tribes from their homeland, they also lose their language. This is happening in the, name of development of roads or dams or, you know, uprooting jungles. It's all over India. Wherever you dislocate tribes, you also dislocate their languages. Next. This was my main informant who gave me uh, lots of information about birds. And when the languages die, generally what happens, the grammar dies because the language is no longer spoken. But words remain in their memory. And on that basis, I, and with the help of another ornithologist, produced this book of bird classification of birds. And we matched the names of these great Andamanese words with Latin or scientific names. And many times, we found the parallels. So now Junior was my teacher, as I should say, who gave me a lot of information about birds and folktales also. Next. This is the book. These are some of the uh, parallel uh, names of the great Andamanese words, as well as with the Latin or scientific names, because they both translate into English the same way, which is interesting. Next. Yeah, can we have this? Now, this is Boa Senior singing. She's no more. This is a sample of Bo language, which is no longer with us. 
So, but I have a large recordings of Bo and my dictionary, which I made multilingual, multiscriptal, interactive dictionary, has 39% of words from Bo. Next. This is a folk tale of a great Andamanis, how the Andamanis originated. And now Junior told me this story, which was brought out by National Book Trust, beautifully illustrated. Next. Now, this is also a new phenomena which is coming on the Andaman. As you can see, this uh, great Andamanis uh, girl, who's a daughter of the chief, King Jirake, now is inducted in police. And there are many girls now being given employment, so they are naturally drawn away from their standard original lifestyle. Yeah. <coughs> now, most of the children are going to school in uh, Vivekananda School in Port Blair. And uh, that's why I thought it is good to give them a script to write their language. So I wrote Varnamala for them, which is based on Devanagari with little modifications. Next, please. And this is the Varnamala, as you can see. They don't have all the sounds that Hindi has. They have lost some sounds, so don't think it's incomplete. This is the sound system of the language which is existing, which is currently used. Uh, I have cop some copies of these uh, outside and will be available. I can uh, distribute them. Uh, this is a turtle hunting song, uh, which was uh, why I brought it because... Sorry. Duda ma kwai la rang, lo da pui jaga tirin lo, alo da pui jaga tirin lo, alo da pui jaga tirin lo. This is an interesting song because this is sung by a Karen speaker who learnt great in the manis in 1935. And I hunted him out in a North Andaman in a Karen village because the Gandamanese people told him that we call him our... Uh, Buddha Baba, Bora Baba, so I went and interviewed him and he still remembered this song, which is not remembered by the other members of the society. Next. Okay, this is the uh, dictionary of uh, Great Andamanis. So I've just brought the, uh, we can just show this. Uh, I have not brought the dictionary, it's heavy, but you can see the, it's, it's brought out by a Delhi publisher, Ratna Sagar, so it's easily available. Next. And uh, we can skip this. Uh, no, I think going on. OK, some of the statistics from the dictionary, which may not interest you right now. But I collected large number of uh, words for ecological phenomena of be it bees or plants or, <laughs> you know. Next. OK, this is the specimen of the grammar, which was just brought out by Brill. Uh, few months ago. If anybody wants to see more, this is my website and the, my address. Thank you. So this is just in a gist. This is a very short, this is in a gist, a short journey of the Andaman Islands in few minutes, which I made in several years. <laughs> just judging from the applause, I think we're all extremely aware how important this work is. And I think possibly this is one of the few sessions in this entire festival where all of us will go away knowing more than we came into the room with. So thank you very much for thank making you. that possible. Um, I, I have to say, when I was uh, watching the AV along with everybody else, I had a couple of, oh, wow, moments. Yeah, one of which was um, the, 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 the idea of the first migration from the African continent, yeah, which is 70,000 years ago. That was very much a wow moment for me. Uh, but the other thing, of course, the poignancy of uh, being the only person left who speaks a language, uh, which doesn't mean that you can't communicate because perhaps you know many languages, but to know that nobody else can understand you when you use this word, how tragic, how heartbreaking must that be, even for the speaker, you know, uh, if not for us who, watch it from the outside. Shall I, shall I Please. Give, give you an anecdote? I, you said it very right. You know, once I saw Boa Senior talking to birds, and I said, what are you doing? And she says, I'm talking to birds. I said, but why are you talking to birds? He says, because no one else understands me. Birds understand me. I said, how come birds understand you? He said, because birds are our ancestors. And I said, is it really true that you think birds are your ancestors and they are learning, they understand you? And she said, yes. 
And then I went to Now Junior and extracted a folktale on that, which came out as a next folktale, which National Book Trust, it has become already very popular. Why Andamanis don't kill birds? Because they think they are, our, they are their ancestors. Jiro Mite, Mite is a dove, uh, para, you know. And this, I, I saw Boa Senior talking to birds, just what you're saying, that it was, she was very, very miserable. So when I learned her language, she was very happy to see me, and she used to converse, and I, my, my bow is very bad, so I mean, I've almost <laughs> forgotten, but whatever little I could, you know, so th that made her very happy. Um, well, just running on from what you said, right, who are you going to teach this language to? <laughs> I do not know, because their children have been trying to uh, convince that they should learn their languages from the elderly folks who are remaining. There are five, I shouldn't use the word terminal, but that's what linguists use five terminal speakers, you know, I don't like the word ter terminal, but you see, the, the thing is that when you don't use the language, language is, dies, dies fast. Language survives because of its use, and mainly when it is used at home. So and obviously, widely like English if you use it in multifunctional, multifunctional arena. So the thing is that great in the meanies is getting lost from home environment. So somebody has to speak to them, and I used to tell Bo, Boa, Boa Senior and now Junior and other people, why don't you talk in your own language to the children? And they all speak Andamani Hindi. They don't want to speak uh, their heritage language. Mm. And so I have no one to uh, really teach, but their parents could not teach. Yeah. You see, well, yeah. maybe you'll find some people in the audience who want. <laughs> um, Bow lessons, but uh, also I think what <clears throat> what you were saying uh, in the course of the presentation about when you uh, when you dislocate um, a tribal community from their land, you actually dislocate them from themselves in mm -hmm. a way, or all their cultural manifestations. Um, the lands are sacred. Uh, there's a very different um, understanding of oneself mm -hmm. space in the world. Um, and that, of course, touches on the heart of the kind of development yes. that we're experiencing yeah. um, in our country now, that it's not simply the Andamanese who are, who are being dislocated, but, you know, mm -hmm. swathes of tribals um, all over the country. Um, and you've worked on tribe, other tribe, mainland tribal languages mm -hmm. before you started working in the Andamans. So what are the other, um, in, in the case of the Andamans, we can say isolation contributes largely to why, um, why that those languages are endangered, but what else endangers a language? Like the lack of language. use, the lack of use of the language endangers, and the, the use, the increase or decrease in the use depends upon the government policy also, the education policy. If we have mother tongue instruction in right in the primary school up to a certain level, then we ensure the, uh, not only the preservation, but the growth of the languages. I have been writing and I have written for last uh, several years about the uh, multilingual education in phases, not all of a sudden, but in phases to begin with, with two languages, moving on to another three, three languages and to four languages ultimately, so as to retain the home language as well as the state language and also teach students Hindi and English. So use of language really ensures the growth and the sustenance of language. And let me tell you, this dislocation thing is, is very, very crucial because when you dislocate a, dislocate a tribe, you not only dislocate the tribe physically, so he loses his attachment to the ground, to the soil, to the leaves, but yes, he dis, the, the language is dislocated and languages, there are many manifestations of languages which are preserved in, eco, in ecological, they, they actually signatures of ecological and archaeological uh, in nature, and those are lost. And this is what happened with the, most of the tribes that I have worked with, that when they get to the city, either in, in search of a job, they also lose their knowledge systems. And that's a very big loss for the country because we are losing knowledge system one by one, be it available in the medicinal plants, be it available in the other uh, growth of the plants and other things. For example, I remember Boa Senior used to tell me that I have pain here, sometimes pain here, I wish I was in uh, Maya Bandar, that's where she came from. She says, I wish I was in Maya Bandar, I exactly knew which clay to apply on my head, which clay to apply on my back for my pain, which clay to apply where. You see, so these, these are the things that, which, are, which gives you life. So life 
are driven, resources are taken away from you. You can imagine the plight of these people. And how very localized these knowledge systems are, that in so and so place I get this kind of play, and I'm unwell because I can't access. Mm -hmm. Hello? <laughs> You're speaking um, very, very yes. softly, maybe. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, one reason why that's happening is because I'm getting so involved in my conversation, I kind of forgot about you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, uh, how localized um, these uh, knowledge systems are. But it's not simply a loss to our country, it's a loss to humanity. I mean, everything that is forgotten. Uh, any, uh, every way of being more human, every way of being more connected to one's immediate environment can only enrich us all. Um, so the, the loss is enormous. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit um, about language and memory. Yeah, mm -hmm. and of course we've just acknowledged that what we lose is enormous. And there's a magnificent play by the Irish playwright Brian Friel called Translations, and I know there's at least a couple of people here who are familiar with the play. It's about renaming, um, you know, in a colonial, and we know that from our Indian experience as well, that when the colonizers come, perhaps they don't like our names. More likely, they can't be bothered to pronounce them correctly. So they're just like, oh, well, okay, now you're Havelock, or now you are, uh, I don't know, Bombay, or whatever it is. Um, but in the Brian Friel play, he suggests that names cannot be erased quite so easily, that names and memories haunt physical locations, and you just have to be able to reach them again. And one of the ways you can reach them is by reviving the language in which that thing is named. So Yeah, that's very true. In fact, when I, again, I will draw examples from the great Andamanis, so we are discussing vanishing voices of the great Andamanis. When I reached the island, people had uh, almost in a chorus told me that they have forgotten their language, they don't remember a thing. So when I said, how do you say I'm hungry? They said, Mujhe bhook laga hai. I said, no, that's okay, but how do you say in your language, I'm hungry? They said, we don't say it in our language. So from that point, I had to make them relive their old uh, history or past to find out that what it would be. And it took me a while. And you know, the stories came out, the songs came out. For example, I realized that language dies first, songs die second. Songs stay in your memory for a lo much longer than the uh, language does. So it's very essential to document songs, riddles, lullabies. And what Professor Devi is doing is, uh, is also very fantastic because this is going to sustain for a long time and we would know how language was used. This is one of the uses of the language. So as far as the memory is concerned, I also realize that you may forget how to say mujhe bhook lagi hai or how to say I'm hungry, but you may not forget what is this, what is this fruit called which is growing on this tree and you've been seeing it all your life. What is this leaf called? And this is how I collected large number of names of plants and fruits and other things. In fact, uh, in my brochure which I have given you, for the first time you will notice there are names of the islands. And these names of the islands that we know of, like Port Blair and Ross Island and Havoc, Havelock Island, these are all English names. But the original names are here on your, uh, this page. And you can see these are the real names which for the first time was collected by us. They were collected by us and I have named them which island was called what. And the translation of each of these names are interesting. One island is called I, that island of bamboo. So you know the bamboo, a variety of bamboos grow there. They don't have one kind of bamboos, they have variety of bamboos because the, one of the folk tales of great Andamanis is the first Andamania for the first human being was born out of bamboo. Yeah. This is how the story starts. So bamboo is very important for them. Then there is a island which is known for uh, where the sunshine falls first, so you know it is facing the east. You know, there are interesting, e every island has a meaning which is, which is directly related to ecology. But Port Bear and uh, Ross Island and Havelock Island do not give us any of those things. So translation is bad. I think we should retain our original heritage languages, the names of the 
products, names of the places, because they tell us a lot about the past history. See, language is also uh, is another storehouse for human migration, human civilization, human history, and above all, uh, human thought process. So that's very important. I think the last is very important to know the cognitive world of the society, which perhaps is on the verge of death, its death, or maybe dying fast. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, names like, uh, can you hear me? Um, names like Fort Blair and Havelock, uh, they can tell in imperial histories. And I'm reminded very much of, you know, in the Semitic traditions, in the Bible and in the Quran and in the, in the Jew Jewish uh, Pentateuch, um, the first thing that God gives Adam is the power to name. <laughs> yeah, and to name something is to own it and to control it. So when something becomes Havelock, then you know that you own it. And, you know, this fabulous Indian tradition, when a girl gets married and goes into another family, not only does she change her surname, but they change her first name as well. Yeah. Uh, so it's an act of extreme imperialism. So, you know, it's one yeah. of the, And also, uh, I wanted to comment that uh, all of us have this experience of forgetting languages that we knew, perhaps, in our childhood, but we don't forget the lullabies. We don't forget the songs. I mean, I've forgotten a lot of my childhood languages, but silly little ditties, you know, tunes will, will stay in my head. Um, and so in so many ways, I, I, I think um, the argument is that culture and language are coterminous oh, yes. in a way that uh, perhaps In fact, we believe is. language, we believe that languages is a co-evolutionary process, uh, which, is, which, in combine, which combines the culture along with it. And this is represented very, very distinctively in the language. And since you're talking about other tribal languages, I'm reminded of Northeast languages of uh, uh, both Austroasiatic family and tibeto burman family. You'll be surprised to know, maybe some of you are from that area, that you have a large number of words, I can say, of phrases, words, I should say, they cannot be translated, untranslatable into any language because they emote the culture that the language has grown. For example, Khasi has 57 ways of crying. Crying? Crying. The verb to cry, how many types of cry you can have? 59 ways of walking. I'm very, very cautious when I walk in Shillong because I know somebody must be terming, oh, she was walking like this or she was walking like that. 59 ways of walking. And many of the other activity words have variety of uh, phrases or words which are amazing. When I was working in the Northeast, I realized that the whole area I termed as a walking area because I realized that, uh, for example, yaid is a term in Khasi to walk. So you can say yaid bagbak, yaid bukbuk, yaid bagbak, yaid bet bet, yaid rok rok you. These are the reduplicated syllables which in isolation means nothing, but when they are combined with the proper verb, then it means various kind of manner. It indicates various kind of manner. And this is not true of only Khasi or Jaintia. It's also true of other tibeto burman languages like Tangkul, Naga, Ahom. Uh, there are many, all, in fact, the entire Northeast has large varieties of these words. Now, if you, if you start translating, it is very difficult to translate by mono word. You have to explain it in two, three sentences the way I'm explaining. And these words have evolved with the language. That explains the cognitive, that's what I said earlier. These language represents your cognition. This is how a, a typical Khasi or a Jaintia speaker conceptualizes somebody's action. And that has been represented by the language. And these are the kind of examples you'll find. For example, uh, the Santhali has eight or nine words for smell. Right. Andamanis has 20 words for smell. I could only collect 20. I'm sure they have more. And they have, every, this is smell reminds me of interesting thing which you will be happy to know. Andamanis divide the world into two. One which smells, the one which does not. <laughs> and the one which does not is, are the spirits. Their ancestors which they think are protecting them throughout the life in form of spirits, they don't smell. The rest of the world smells. And they say there is a smell of a book, there's a smell of a glass, there's a smell of a pebble. Pebbles also, variety of pebbles smell differently. They have different names. So a pebble which is inside the sea, which is very much deep inside the water, has a different smell. The pebble which is lying on the shore 
has a different smell. The pebble that you have brought home has a different smell. So the world which is smelly world, they live in the smelly world, but they remember the non-smelly the spirits. So you know, these are amazing. No, and what is quotidian, you know, <laughs> for us, uh, a pebble is a pebble, but if you have so many different kinds of pebbles. I'm trying. Uh, I think my <laughs> collar is flopping over. Um, I was saying, um, what is quotidian? What is quotidian in different lives? Uh, for us, a pebble is perhaps a pebble. But if your life is littered with pebbles, then pebbles have to be distinguished uh, from each other. And of course, that also uh, is an indication of the dynamism of language. Language grows because it needs to express or encompass more and more experiences. I mean, I'm just thinking of um, even in the however many years um, I've been alive, the new words I've learned in the last 10 years, uh, which now describe my experience, uh, has been remarkable. I mean, I didn't know um, until I came to a literary festival that agenting is a word. Have you been agented? Oh, she's agenting for me. Uh, and this is quite apart from SMS and text and you know, all the, all the words that we um, uh, you know, just don't even think of as neologisms anymore. But uh, um, I'm going to ask just one more question and then um, I'll invite you all to join our conversation and I will hold my mic like this. Um, <laughs> uh, with regard to the dynamism of languages and how languages grow and evolve in response to an environment, I wanted to talk to you about um, the dictionary that you worked on and also um, creating a Devnagari-based script for the, uh, for the Andamanese languages. Now, these are um, quite overtly stabilizing processes. The, a, a dictionary does stabilize a language, um, a, as would a script. So. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, pioneering work because this language hasn't been scripted before, neither has it been uh, lexiconized. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, what it means to stabilize a language? Well, uh, if you want language to be taught in school, you have to codify it. You have to modernize it. There are two factors that one has to take into account before you start uh, applying it in a formal education system. And I, since I knew that language is on the verge of its extinction, I had a very strong urge of uh, preserving it in a way, though I don't like languages to be preserved. But for this particular example, it had to be preserved because I could see when I started working, there were 10 speakers right in front of my eyes, five died. So the, 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 I mean, they were getting extinct very fast. So codification had to be done. Devanagari script was used because Andaman Nicobar comes under Hindi belt. So their state language is Hindi. So the, the, the slide that I showed you of school children going to school, they all know Devanagari very well. And anyway, Devanagari is a very, very scientific script. And I thought there would not be a better script to follow or give to great Andamani than that. I had to make couple, one modification in the script for the length of the vowel because Devanagari does not distinguish between short vowel or long vowel, like A ah and A, ah, both are the same. But in this language, they were distinct. So I just uh, used the classical music symbol, which looks like an S, which means stretching of the vowel. So that's what I used. So some modification, and that's why Varnamala was kept. And then I was very happy when I distributed this Varnamala in the school among the Andamanese children. They thought they can write what they know, whatever little Andamani they knew. And I said, write it, and they could write it. That's so that's why it is very essential to codify and to give some kind of a, uh, you know, st what you call stabilization. Mm -hmm. It's also the sustenance power that Absolutely. I think I have uh, yeah. been able to give. And any time the government of uh, government of Andaman Nicobar wants to take this into school, they are they are all free to do it, and I'm willing to help. But they are not keen, it seems. Yeah. They are not keen to introduce Andaman. Is not even in zero. Uh, period which generally school children have in our country, you know, where they can learn anything from stitching to learning a new language. How um, incredibly tragic, you know, to be uh, persuaded uh, by the hegemony of another culture to give up your own language, to give up your own words, um, you know, because they're Good not enough. worthy, they're not get you anywhere. 
Um, right. Uh, May I play that please, little please. piece? Uh, yeah. uh, Karthik, can you play that uh, uh, Lost Forever? There is a little, uh, very, very small strip of uh, um, video that I wrote, no, gave it to yeah, Survival International. क्या बोला? Last words. What do you Grab hold of it. I think she, she said it all. What we linguists and language activists and uh, you know the other people who are interested in saving language, they did not know a person from Andaman Island, Goa senior could say such Sanskrit words. She's saying, grab it before I leave this world, uh, the language will go away. How did she die? She, well, it's mysterious. <laughs> she, she had, uh, she was sick and uh, she was uh, being under treatment. They brought her from Strait Island to Port Blair and she died in the hospital. So we do not know till today what, is what, ha what really happened. She had pain in the chest, but we do not know what it was. But now Junior died of kidney failure. Most of the men in Nandamani's tribe have become very alcoholic. So that's alcoholic. alcoholic. So that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, just like the, the Native Americans in, in North America. Right, thank you all for being so patient. I'm sure you have a hundred questions. Um, we'd be happy to take them. The gentleman in the check sweater at the back who put up his hand first in the middle. Yeah. <clears throat> no, you, sorry, you're not wearing a check sweater. You can be next. Yeah. You can shift your mic up to here, then you will... Hi, um, well, two questions, but one's very quick. The first one, two, no. are there any um, consonant sounds in Great Andamanese that don't exist in Hindi at all? And the second question was um, about the folk tales. Do they contain a creation myth at all? What is it? Folk tale. Do hmm? the folk tales uh, contain a creation myth? And are there consonant sounds that resemble okay. Hindi consonants? Okay, the folk tale, this, uh, where is that, the other one? Uh, this is the creation myth, and uh, I'll, I have uh, I've brought very few copies, but I won't mind giving it to you. This is a creation myth, and it talks about how the Andamanis took place, uh, came to came into being in this world. As far as the consonant sounds are concerned, at the end of the word mala, there are all the consonants given. Sorry, and uh, you will be uh, there's a. Uh, as I said, the, there's a last page in which all the letters are given of consonants. They don't have some consonants, but that doesn't mean they did not have it. Because we could decipher the uh, existence of the consonants in some songs. For example, there's a consonant G, which is no longer there in the Andamanis, present great Andamanis. But one of my informants' name was Golat. So obviously, G was there. Similarly, there are songs which starts like Gila Gila. And so G was there. So there were many consonants which got lost. And this is what happens when language dies, the internal structure starts decaying day by day. You see, this is just a small sample that you can see in consonants. There are large grammatical categories disappeared. You see, so there are, these are there inside, the, her sound is not there. So when they learn Hindi, they had a tough time of using hair because her, her, you Hindi can't do it. Hindi. Hindi itself is her. Uh, right. Okay, the gentleman who stood up for, yeah. You hear about the culture and the language they have, but uh, in the present realities of dislocation and development, they have to pick up the state language to avail many facilities from the government. As you said, the senior, uh, the last speaker also died in a hospital. 
so is it right uh, is it right on our part or do the present generation is ready to accept that struggle to keep uh, to keep to that older language or is it right on our part uh, to make them stick to their language uh, uh, language and uh, and as she said about multilingual education our education system is not efficient to teach even one language so multilingual is very romantic to teach so how 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 much fair it is on our part to tell the tribals to uh, stick to their own language okay point made thank you i think your question and ropes a uh, large number of questions which would needs a special session but i'll just give you a short answer as far as the tribals are concerned in the andaman islands all these three tribes onge jarwa and great andamanis are at different levels of uh, contact with the outsiders as far as great andamanis are concerned they have been in touch with first with britishers and then with the indians for last more than almost 100 years so there is for they have reached a no point no point return seeker week they cannot go back to their original uh, cultural sociological or historical milieu so they have to be they have to be uh, you know treated differently as far as the jarwas are concerned and we have been writing about it it is better to leave them alone because they live in opulence we don't realize that they live in opulence because the jungle gives them all that they need in fact they say we have more supply than our demand and they they some nutritional studies was done on their bodies they are a very healthy lot they should not be touched onges again live in little andaman and they are in a secluded area but they are on the what you call subsidies by the government as far as the ration is concerned because they have lost their old uh, knack of hunting in the sea and hunting in the jungle so because of the different kinds of contact of different duration these tribes have lost their ability to be self sufficient and in that case they need our help but those who are already self sufficient we should not touch them as far as the multilingual aspect is concerned it looks very uh, uh, scary how to make our children multilingual but let me tell you multilingualism help languages grow they don't help languages die and multilingualism has a doesn't have to be it hasn't has to be forced in europe you know and in switzerland there is four languages children learn and there are many other states and we uh, my kind of multilingualism is introduced in phases so that the child learns one after another but keeps uh, some kind of a dignity associated with his mother tongue why do we lose home language why a khadia speaker or a kuruk speaker is happy to say oh, i am not a kuruk speaker or oh, i have lost khadia speaker because he feels that he has some kind of inferiority complex speaking his mother tongue and that inferiority complex comes from this the way we treat our heritage languages so that mindset has to change and it has to change within the community who speaks the language um yes gentleman in blue uh my question is what do they sing about you mentioned you recorded a lot of their songs what do they sing about and also if i might do the nicobar islands have the same problem and are the nicobar languages are they related to the andaman ones i it's echoing what to do they sing about uh, in the song what what are they singing about and the andaman yeah. uh, uh, and also um do the nicobar islands have the same kind of li linguistic problems as the are you asking the translation of the songs What's the See, topic? The, Boa, the, the song that was sung by Boa Senior, in the first song, uh, the, she is saying that the fruits are very high on the tree, how the children will reach the fruits. The boat song and the, by the Jarwa and the boat song by Onges is undeciphered because uh, they themselves could not tell me. And I, as I said, the Onge, the Jarwa song is in monosyllable, ta 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 like that, you see. Mm -hmm. so one needs to do more work on jarwa song to find out that what it the syllables are constituted of and so is the onge song it only said the person who sang the song he says the the girl is waiting for the boat to come and i asked if the if the boat is carrying her husband or friend or somebody he could not specify so i do not know uh, what was the that is such a beautiful universal no everybody is yeah. waiting for the boat to, to come, come. <laughs> whether it's a metaphor or you're waiting for your boyfriend or you know yeah. 
Yeah. What and was the second question was about do the Nicobar Islands? Yeah, the Nicobar things? Islands I have not investigated, though I plan to do it uh, in near future if, uh, if I get uh, facilities. And facilities means basically permission. It's very difficult to get permission. Nicobaris is our la the languages. There are basically five languages in the Nicobar Islands. And they belong to the Austroasiatic group of the uh, which which is which is also represented in Shillong and Meghalaya, like Khasi and Jaintia. So the, 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 there is a genealogical connection between Austroasiatic languages spoken in Nicobar and the other languages which are spoken in Meghalaya. Um, somebody in the front, the young lady in red. Hello. You talked about giving these languages a script, uh, but don't you think that giving them a script, uh, especially a North Indian script, would destroy their essence? Well, I mean, that's one basic question. I what? love questions that start with don't you think. They have only one answer. <laughs> the script don't, dis script don't destroy the essence. You have a Devanagari script, you can read Upanishadas, you can read Brahmanas, you can read all the Ashtadhyayi and other Sanskrit texts. It doesn't destroy the uh, this essence of Sanskrit language. Script is, is basically how to record speech. Okay? So different languages have different script, the way they are recording it. It's, a, it's one way of recording it. My job or my uh, motivation to record this language was because it was dying. If I had not given the script, there was no way the great Andamanese children would have facilitated to write their own language if they want to. And, uh, Andam and great Andamanese is a language, as I said, being spoken in Andaman, which is in Hindi belt, so Devanagari script was the best solution. I this. think your point was that the Andamanese language was um, uh, being threatened by putting it in Devanagari, am I right? No, he's saying the okay. lose of oh. essence oh. of the language. Oh, okay. the, if, you, if you mean the by essence, see, the, as I said, the script basically gives you sustenance over the years. Now you can read old text because there was some script. Why I'm unable to read Andamanis which was spoken, let's say, 500 years ago because nobody ever penned it, penned it down. So script is not bad, but script should, should be devised in a way it should be as close to the sound system as possible. That the, you know, the job of the linguist or the scriptologist to maintain that the, the, the letters that you do take into account should be as close to the sound so that when it is gone, the language is gone, you can at least find out from there, from the script, some of the sound system, how they were combined and so on and so forth. Right, I was going to ask for a last question, but apparently we're completely out of time. Um, so thank you very, very much, Prof uh, Professor Anvita Abbi, for fascinating, fascinating mm -hmm. afternoon. I'm sure we've all gone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We wish to thank Anvita Abhi and uh, Arisha Sattar. I hope we don't forget our languages ever. Uh, the authors will be available at the book signing area, which is outside on the left. And uh, the next